Well, I think that that, I guess, is probably our cue to start. Oh, wow. um, we are very prepared for this panel. Um, Super prepared. <laughs> you we have glitter tape. For all coming. Everybody, have all people for coming. Um, hello? Uh, and this is the uh, How to Be an Enforcer panel, the Enforcer Experience panel. Um, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm going to be moderating here today because I have actually only been an enforcer for a total of five hours. Uh, so I am horribly underqualified, uh, which is great because all of these people here are incredibly qualified and I'm going to ask them a bunch of great questions. Uh, and We're going to kind of learn a little bit about what it's like to be an enforcer uh, and hopefully open that up to a few questions for all of you uh, towards the end of the panel. Uh, so I would like to just start over here. Uh, with my good friend Trin, uh, and if she could introduce herself, and then we'll just kind of go down the line and uh, hear about everybody's experiences. Thank you, Tom. Tom is great. I work with Tom. Uh, my name is Trin Garitano, and um, I'm the uh, director of events and motions and various promotions at Cards Against Humanity and Black Box. Uh, and I am the co friend of the Friendshiping podcast, and I have been enforcing since I want to say 2011. Yeah, that's right. Something like that. It's been a while, um, and I, I love enforcing, and I'm so excited to talk about it. Hi, I am Carlin Meyer. Um, I, in my real day job, am an attorney. I work in legal education. Um, so what I do when I'm enforcing is very different from my daily life, and I love it. Um, I've been enforcing since 2010. My first PAX was the very first PAX East. And um, I will talk later about how I dipped my toes into that. But I've been going around the country, going to all of the, like, as many PAXs as I possibly can since then. So this is my ninth PAX. Oh, Unless you count PAX Dev, in which case it's my 12th. Can we clap for that? Yeah. Cool. Uh, I am Andrew, last name Worthen. Worthen, woo! <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, my enforcer handle is Worthen. I just... So I had to go with what I know. Uh, I'm an IT guy by day, and at PAXs all around the country, I am in charge of wrangling various internet celebrities. <laughs> yes. Other things. Uh, I've been doing enforcing since 2009. Yeah, 2009. I've attended, I missed the very first PAX. I missed PAX 04, but I've been going to PAX Prime since 2005. Haven't missed one yet. Uh, this is my 15th third. 16th PAX Enforcing. Yay! I've been around. that I've attended. So, I've been around. Um, now I'm just here and jaded. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I love this. This is really, the signs that say welcome home, it still feels like home. Aww. My name's Kristen Lindsay. I work for Penny Arcade. Um, I am responsible for the development and implementation of the entire Enforcer program. So I've been here from the very beginning, 2003, because our first show was in 2004. Uh, this is my 27th piece. Wow. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, look at all these wonderful people we have. Um, so to start off, I would actually love, Kristen, since you're kind of like, for sure, the Enforcer boss, uh, could you tell us what an enforcer is? Uh, that's a great question. So an enforcer, it, it, the very, very short point form is that they're the show staff for PAX. Um, as to what an enforcer does, uh, that is an incredibly uh, long answer because they do absolutely everything at the show from customer service to line management to badge pickup to running tournaments to helping people get from point A to point B no matter who they are. Um, from running lost and found and helping children find their parents and pretty much any job that needs to be done at a PAX show is probably done by an enforcer. Um, so, yeah, there are show staff. Yeah, and they are incredible. Um, yeah, that's really great. So now that we kind of have a good idea of that, I know for me, uh, my first experience with enforcers was working with Train at Cards Against Humanity, uh, kind of figuring out uh, our crazy panels and all the weird things that we try and do at PAX, and the enforcers for me were always people who helped us do the impossible um, and made sure that all the crazy stuff we ever did um, actually got through. But I'm interested to hear from all of our panelists here what uh, kind of made, what you thought of enforcers before you were an enforcer, kind of what that uh, meant to you, what you thought about, uh, and kind of why you, you maybe got interested through seeing what they did uh, at the different shows. Um, I would love to start here and work our way down. Um, so my first impression of enforcers was, um, I was actually at a PAX, um, I had very overwhelming crowd anxiety. Uh, and I was at a PAX 
uh, with a partner at the time, and I saw these women with these bright shirts on, like pointing at people and telling them where to go, and just like kind of owning the space. And I thought to myself, like, can I, can I do that? Like, who, what, what makes you feel like you are able to be this visible person in our culture, in our space? Uh, and I just thought it was such an incredible culture that I really wanted to be a part of. Um, and I, it was this combination of authority, authority and enthusiasm um, that in my career and in my life I've tried to kind of um, replicate and keep alive. And it's one of the, the reasons why I still enforce is because um, it kind of reinvigorates that spirit that I have for the industry. So I guess um, to wrap that up, my first impression of enforcers was wow, how can I do that too, you know? Like that was, it was just a very like, I think that those might be my people, let's find out. That's awesome. So I never had an experience like that. I've actually never just attended a PAX. Uh, for the longest time, PAX was only in Seattle and I lived very far away from Seattle and all I would see on the internet was there are these people, these enforcers, and they hold the line, they're this like amazing elite squad and they're not hiring, you can't be one, but we're amazing and we've all been doing it since forever. And so it was just like, okay, I'm never gonna be in that club, but it sounds really dope. Um, and so when they announced that there was gonna be a PAX East, it was first of all like, I can actually get to Boston a lot more easily than flying to Seattle, it was a lot more inexpensive for me, it was just a lot more accessible. And then they were suddenly, there were applications open for enforcers. And so I decided, yeah, I think I can, I can try it. I didn't think for a second I was going to get in. I, whatever the right stuff was, I was convinced I didn't have it. Um, and sure enough, I made it in. And um, from that being my first pack, my first experience with any of it, I was just hooked from, and that's why I've been doing it for seven years since. I wanted to add to Carla just uh, really quick that like we became friends because of PAX. Uh, like we met up at a, a game night in Chicago that was like an enforcer regular tabletop meetup and like Carlin's like my best friend ever but also kind of like my PAX mom and I'm really excited to be sitting next to her on this panel. <laughs> hey. uh, I went to PAX because I love Penny Arcade. I love the comic. Um, there's a lot of people now that come to PAX because they love PAX. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. PAX is awesome you made the right choice. Uh, I read the comic every single day it came out. It was a big part of my life. I was on the forums, everything like that. I started attending because that was something I really liked and it was a convention about that. The reason I started enforcing is because I felt I had gotten everything, I had seen everything there was to see in the show and I wanted to give back. Um, I was getting not burned out, but just I, I felt like I had seen everything there was to see at the show and I still wanted to keep going, but I knew if I kept going, I would just be bored and jaded. <laughs> so I decided, hey, I've been doing this for a while. I think I would be pretty good at helping people out. I'm going to be an enforcer and help continue that community. So the answer is obviously going to be a little different for me. Um, when this might come as a great shock to some of you, but when um, we at Penny Arcade decided that we wanted to have a big gaming festival, none of us actually knew what the hell we were doing. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, we're a bunch of artists and writers and nerds, and we want to have a big show, and I don't know, let's just like find a convention center and go hang out, and it'll be rad, and we'll tell people to come. Um, so we had a very, very steep learning curve of uh, going from uh, random nerds to event producers, and we took some steps that uh, actual professional event producers look back on and go, oh, you made some interesting choices. <laughs> and uh, one of the biggest things that they say that about are our enforcers. Because um, if you've ever been to a, a Comic-Con somewhere or any kind of pop culture show where they have show staff, um, I, I mean, I've done that too. I've gone to San Diego Comic-Con and asked a guy in a San Diego Comic-Con shirt where to find room X, and he doesn't fucking know. Like, it's just, oh, oh Sean, Sean, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and I thought, I thought to myself, I'm gonna make a show staff that can do better. It's very ambitious of me. Um, and uh, I didn't really uh, know what I had thrown myself into, but I decided that I was going to find staff um, that, uh, that I could be really proud of, and it somehow worked out. I don't know how I did it. I'd never managed staff before. That's not what I went to school for. It's not what I'd ever trained for. But I wanted to build a community 
rather than just people who are going to show up for a weekend for a free shirt and badge and then go away and never see them again. Um, so that was the tactic we approached enforcing with. Um, the enforcers, are, not a lot of people know this, but the enforcers are a community that actually run year round. Uh, they do social events outside of an actual PAX. Um, we actually, we use enforcers for other events as well. We, Child's Play uses enforcers to the charity um, to help volunteer with that organization. There's a forum uh, that is active all the time. There are, there are, we've had marriages out of enforcers. We've had friendships for life out of enforcers. Like it's, we're friends year round, not just at PAX time. And I felt like that was going to be a key, keystone to building a really strong um, show staff. Uh, so that's kind of how I came into it. I said, I want show staff that are not just show staff. I want a show community. And that's where the enforcers came up. That's awesome. And I think that for me was definitely like what I see out of the enforcers compared to any other show that I've ever been to as well. Um, I actually really like that community point. And going off that, I kind of want to ask everybody here, what makes you continue to come back as an enforcer? Because it seems like everybody here has definitely been on continuing to enforce for years and years. Um, so what about this community specifically kind of speaks to you uh, and makes you want to keep coming back to these types of conventions? And I think we can probably just start with Trin and roll back down the line. Uh, so that's a really interesting question because three years ago I made this really emotional Tumblr post about how this was going to be my last year enforcing. <laughs> uh, and here I am. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. Uh, but like, uh, it was kind of like I mentioned earlier in that, um, so I, like I said, I work in, in the games industry and there's nothing quite like being on the other side of the table. Um, like I've attended cons as an attendee, I've attended it as an exhibitor, um, and I've been staff at other shows, like I've been uh, at other comic cons and stuff like that. Um, and I don't think I'll ever do that again, but I think I will, I'll probably enforce like to like, I don't know, old, old, older, older, I don't know, I'm in my 30s. Um, uh, and, and a big part of it is just, this is, I think, the best part of our industry. And this is the best part of being at cons is the community of, I can walk into this room of people in orange shirts and I know that I'll sit next to one of them and we'll have something in common. Uh, and whether that's just, we're here to make this place better and, and run efficiently uh, and be accessible to as many people as we can, or maybe we both kiss the same person in Dragon Age. Uh, <laughs> so I know, who did you kiss in Dragon Age? All of them. Okay. okay. <laughs> I wanted to know that too. Thank oh, I mean, like, so Al, okay, so this is for real now. Uh, Alistair in Dragon Age Origins is the first video game character that I fell in real love with, uh, and that is part of my uh, friendship with Carlin. It's the that? first conversation we ever had. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so Carlin, if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, I forgot the question just that quickly. Why do I have to ask? <laughs> yeah. So, um, Wait, no, first, who, so it was just Alice there? No, you no. Didn't. It, no, no, it, it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah my Swooping is up. bad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I know, I need to, to move on. It's over, but still, it's fun. Um, so that's where my heart is. But, um, yeah, so similarly, very similar to what, what Trin was saying. I've worked at other shows, and um, since, you know, Tupac's is the first or convention at all that I had volunteered at, I immediately went to other conventions, was like, I'm ready to keep this high going. And I was like super disappointed, like, oh, people here are not like down to talk to each other and hang out and you're just kind of here to work for the day. And like, I was just ready for this community thing to just permeate throughout every convention I went to and it didn't happen. And so um, I keep coming back and I've done, like I said, all, all the US PAXs. And sometimes it's people I know there, sometimes it's different people at, at different shows, but it's always the same type of community, type of energy. And it's it's um, it's really fantastic. I actually had a kid three years ago. So I took a couple years off just because it didn't work out, you know, infant and some people do it, but I wasn't able to. And, um, and I, I thought also that like, maybe I've grown out of this, you know, I'm in my thirties now, I'm a mom. And sure enough, you know, when they announced PAX San Antonio, I said, let me try it again and I'm hooked again. And I'm back, you know. So yeah, I, I thought I might be done, and I'm, I'm definitely not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will probably never retire. <laughs> it's always there's always prime West. Yes, sir. Prime for life. Um, <laughs> I live in Seattle, so as long as it's the backyard show, I will be there. Uh, I don't know about going around to the other U.S. shows, but you know, at some point, uh, I actually was was asked this question by an uh, uh, enforcer that is very near and dear to me, one of my very good friends that I've met enforcing. And the reason I come back is because of the enforcers that I work with. Um, 
y'all are great. Those of you that are sitting in front of me, those of you that will watch this later, you're all great too. Um, I have made some incredible friends, uh, friends for life here. But the question that I was asked was something along the lines of when is it time to retire? Um, and my answer to that is I think I would retire when I'm out of things to do when I have no more challenges in front of me enforcing. Um, I don't know when that's gonna happen. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> and I've been here for half of my life, when you think about it. I've been doing this for 15 years, um, and I haven't run out of things to do yet, so. That's cool. The, uh, the flippant answer for me is, of course, what's my job? I'm not gonna stop showing up at it because <laughs> this is my job. Uh, but um, realistically, I, I sometimes joke to people that I have 4,000 children, and um, it feels true. Uh, I, I'm very, very, very proud to uh, know the enforcers and be part of what they do, uh, and I'm never going to stop being part of that just because I love them so much and I want to continue. That's wonderful. Um, so for me, my kind of real question, again, moving off some of this is like, uh, what I've really noticed is, like, especially at a big fan convention like this, everybody's super excited and really wants to like see all the fun different things that are going wrong along. We have cosplayers. Uh, for me, for the outside, uh, looking at enforcers, I've seen something that everyone is kind of able to, um, it seems in a way, express their personality while still being an enforcer. And that's something that I always thought has been kind of cool, and I kind of wanted to ask, uh, in your guys' opinion, what do you think about kind of that balance of, like, being a professional and being a fan as an enforcer, like, is there a line you have to draw between, like, I can't be a fan, I need to be doing my job, or are you really allowed to kind of bring into that and say, like, oh, no, I'm doing this because of how big a fan I am, and is there a line to be drawn, is there not? How, how do you all feel about that? Uh, that's a really interesting question uh, because I see, um, and one of my favorite things is seeing enforcers who incorporate cosplay into their their uniform and their shirt. Um, and I, I there's a slides later on that you'll see. I, I've you listened. actually uh, cosplayed as Velma yesterday, right? No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing an orange shirt and a skirt, and somebody comes up to me and they're like, "Oh my God, your glasses like that? You were cosplaying as Velma?" And I'm like, "Jinkies!" Anyway, <laughs> but. Uh, I, I love to see the creativity in that line, which is, um, so uh, one time I, I had um, one piece of N7 armor from Mass Effect because I was kind of cosplaying Legion because like it's like he's got the one piece of N7, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, what's important is that it's a combination of those two things because I think that we maintain our enthusiasm for our job when we're tired and our feet hurt and that sort of thing because we know that we are part of that fandom. Like, everybody here is, is as excited to be here as I am, so I want to make the show as good as I can for them because I would want this show to be good. Uh, and and I, I think that sometimes we have to, like, rein back in that enthusiasm, you know, depending on what our job is and, and who we're, we're talking to. Um, like, I can't uh, fangirl all over, uh, like, the Bioware booth or, or whatever, cause like, you know, like I said, I fell in love with Alistair. Uh, uh, while I'm enforcing, I need to maintain a professionalism, but I don't think those things are at odds. I do think that it's something that we have in our in our minds all of the time. So to piggyback off of that, I'm going to tell you an embarrassing story. Yay! Um, at one point, uh, this was seven years ago, I had just been introduced to the Proto Men through PAX, and that changed my life. I was like, this is so amazing, it was like the best show I've ever seen in my life, my favorite band in the world. And I was like crazy in love with them, it was so cool. And um, I had come off shift, and they were at their, you know, their signing booth, and I did like the fangirl thing of like, oh my gosh, you're so great, and they're like signing myself, and I'm taking pictures, and it was just like totally like, you know, this is just it came off a concert. I did all of that stuff, and then I went to Spare Board, which is, um, if you're enforcing, it's kind of a, I'm not assigned to a specific place, but I'm here, and whenever you need someone to do something, you can assign me out to do that thing. I went to Spare Board, because, you know, I'm still high on energy from the show and I have time. And um, they immediately said, okay, we need someone to take the protom and stuff all down to their van with them. So like literally like a minute later, I'm just like, oh, and now I'm assigned to like walk with you like a normal a professional human being down to your van. And I had, you know, just a second ago, been like, oh my God. And so like at that moment I realized like, yeah, there's kind of like this persona, like, you know, I'm not, <laughs> maybe not fangirling in the shirt anymore, you know, like having that moment. So, um, so yeah, I, from then, you know, I've, I've grown up a bit, and um, I don't really have those experiences much anymore, but that was the first time that it was really apparent to me that, like, yeah, you, it's kind of a different dynamic. 
I think the passionate enforcers are the best enforcers. Yep. Um, so no, don't don't turn your fandom off. Um, don't let it get in the way of doing what needs to be done. If you're escorting somebody around, don't like, you know, hey, can I get your autograph in the middle of the whole space you're trying to walk them through? But yeah, no, be passionate. Be be a fan. Wear crazy costumes. There's a guy at East in 2010 who showed up in full plate armor and enforced and didn't die. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, meat shield. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, go go hog wild. It's just, you know, make sure the uh, the logo on the back of the shirt is always visible. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's essentially the rule. Like, in terms of policy, like, what is the policy for enforcers wanting to express themselves? Um, for me, it was always really important that they had fun while they were here. I didn't want enforcing to be a drag. Um, and, I mean, this is a video game and gaming festival show. Obviously, we're all fans. I wanted people to be able to do that and enjoy that, whether that included cosplay or seeing some of their favorite um, acts or, or developers or whatever while they were here. So I, it's just always been very simple that the six rules of PAX, which are on the back of our badges and then show the, the show program and stuff like that, apply to enforcers as equal as they am, uh, impl apply to attendees. And one of those rules is that you can't make other people uncomfortable. And it's pretty simple. And, you know, if you're going to freak out on someone because um, you're a fan, you're going to make them uncomfortable. So you need to rein that in. And it applies to the enforcers in those situations just like it would apply to anybody else. But I, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see them with their orange mohawks or their fallout suit cosplay. Like Boston, the color, or in, rather in Seattle, the color is blue. So we get fallout suit cosplay where they just put enforcer on the back of a, of a vault suit and it looks really cool. Uh, sorry, yeah, the, the vault boy suits. Um, so I, I love to see those sort of adaptations and where we get to celebrate our culture but at the same time do an effective job and follow the rules. So that's pretty simple. That's awesome. Um, kind of going off this next question, I, I want to wonder, like, PAX itself definitely has a culture to the convention. Um, and I'm going to guess that I already know the answer to this, but I kind of want to ask, do enforcers have their own kind of culture that exists within PAX? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. What, what, I was like, Kristen yeah, should just take this. Maybe Sean should take this one for us. Um, yes, we, we, we've been together for, uh, since 2004 now, some of us, there's obviously a very healthy uh, repertoire of jokes, of, of war stories, of, um, you know, the, the, a culture is going to build itself all in that, um, yeah, all, you know, all hail ball. There's definitely a, a crossover of PAX lore, but there's a very rich um, lexicon of enforcer lore as well, just simply due to the length of time that we've spelt together and the interconnectedness of the community. You know, when we're, when we're all in IRC or Slack or Facebook or whatever social media platform of your choice happens to be, like, enforcers are a very connected community and it's gonna generate, it's, it's a wide variety of, of those connections. So absolutely, there is a very thick enforcer culture. That's awesome. Um, are there any, uh, maybe this is also something nobody wants to say, are there any fun traditions uh, of enforcing that any of you have been a part of, like, this? Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, I, mean, I am going to have to confess, Sean is just dying in the back. <laughs> he's, he's, oh, there he is! Yeah. Oh, look! So, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, everyone look up here. Look at yeah, look it up. Everyone do not look here. Sean dying in the background. Um, so satellite theater is one of our largest departments here at PAX, and the satellite theater staff um, is responsible for basically any panel room or theater or event space uh, that isn't on the show floor and isn't the main theater. So it covers panel rooms like this. It also covers PAX Arena, which is a huge activation. It'll cover smaller activations like the Jackbox stage or um, the jam space or the AFK room, like basically anything that's sort of outside of the large floor, show floor rooms. And um, Sean is, is uh, the manager in charge of that large group of people. And for whatever reason, many years ago, it became traditional for all his deputies and sub-managers to make him absolutely miserable at all times. <laughs> because Sean is actually quite a shy guy, as it turns out. And every year they develop like essentially a, a prank, like some, some theme. Um, that they're going to do, and it has rained, and, and it, he works pretty much all of our shows, so 
they have many times a year that they do this to him, but it has ranged from making him like a, you know, a man of the month calendar where every month is him. <laughs> uh, to, I don't, like, we've got like some kind of Shonalton thing going on here this year. I'm, Sean, I'm, Sean really Oh, yeah, yeah. To, uh, like, what are some of the other ones? Oh yeah, the buttons. They made fake. They made buttons with his face, but every day the button got progressively bigger <laughs> until they were all walking around with like like Flav. You know, what's his name? The Rav Flav of Flav size clock size buttons with his face on them, and it absolutely mortifies this poor man. Four times a year, going five times a year now because we just added another show. Have fun, Sean. Um, and and now they're carrying this around with them everywhere, and and he, it, he would probably really like it to stop, but it's. <laughs> It's tradition now. It is now enforcer culture to embarrass Sean. More, more than just making fun of Sean, buttons are a big. Oh yeah. Buttons are a big thing, and you know there's penny arcade and whatnot, but there's a whole little subculture in. I think yeah. Well, Pax pins themselves. The buttoneering predates even penny arcade. Yeah. So. Uh, we have. I have a bunch of, I have my 15 pieces of flair. Uh, <laughs> I have some old buttons from the various theaters, the satellite theaters. Um, I grew up at PAX in the satellite theater department, um, and we have a, a rich tradition of pranking each other very, very heavily on the last day. We'll tag each other's side. Each theater the will go and like send combat teams to deface the other theaters with fines. Like, some amazingly one. talented artists, uh, Lost Underscore, uh, is an amazing artist and he's created some fantastic things. Kojiro is another one of the enforcers that made really great stickers. I still have one on the back of my iPad. Um, they're just, it's, we love each other and we love to give each other a really hard time um, in a very loving way. Not, not mean, but very creative. It's not mean, Sean. <laughs> and I'd also say that, um, because I, I kind of floated around to several different departments in my time enforcing, I spent some time in sat theater, so I'm doing line control, and I've pretty much settled in the merch, merch booth area. Um, but I would also say that not just the departmental culture, there's also sometimes regional culture, like the Chicago enforcers. We kind of have our own thing, like we, you know, we haven't done it as much lately, but for years we would meet um, once a month and we would do our tabletop gaming nights, and then we would have a Midwest enforcers meet up at every PAX, you know, so you could find people that, you know, they might not be in Seattle, they might not be in Boston, but they're 50 miles away and they'll drive in, you know, and so um, we certainly have, um, I'm sure that's that's true for other regions, I can just speak for the Midwest, but uh, but we definitely try to represent and, and get together in between PAXs as well. Yeah, I mean, this PAX South is really young, but uh, tabletop at PAX South already has a few weird traditions, um, at least on my late night shift. Um, last year, I don't know why, but I had my glitter nail polish with me, and then we just all started painting our nails with glitter nail polish and now I'm gonna go out like to Walgreens and buy like a bunch of different glitter nail polishes for everybody so that we can make it happen. Oh, because we turned into gem shift for some reason. I don't know I don't know why that, that happened. Trin really likes rocks. I really love rocks. This is her computer right here. There's rocks all over it. She's oh, a I like cool big old rock fan. Rocks are cool. Um, and also we like we play jams and like dance the entire time now. Like we somebody brought a speaker and like we're having a good time. Uh, and I, I wanted to, to say something else about the button tradition. So that was extremely formative for me because, um, so Carlin mentioned to me before, um, like my first packs that, oh, like sometimes we do buttons and we trade buttons, um, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what the heck would I put on a button? And then I found this old drawing that, uh, I'm sorry, this old Photoshop project that I made when I was drunk. And it was, uh, I tried to make the most, uh, the most fearsome animal of all. It is the Pegasus bear. It is the grizzly bear with a Pegasus, uh, like a unicorn horn and, 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 uh, and wings. Uh, and uh, I was like, this is so dope. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, 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 you have yeah. it. That was my, my first one. Yeah. So um, I asked uh, Ray Hickraft, uh, one of the enforcers uh, that I that I knew in Chicago, to do a drawing of this Photoshop creation that I made, uh, and that has now like become my symbol for like the past like several years. It's like still my. Uh, there's been several different renditions of the Pega Bear, um, but like it's it's been a really strangely formative thing that this like Pax tradition turned into like this is part of my identity. Oh, and speaking of which, that's another thing, is we go by our handles often, and there are several people that I know, like, in real life, I go to their house, and I can't remember their first name in real life. Yes! Um, and it's not just an internet thing, it's like, my friend Josh, I call him Tao, like, that's his name, and I just have to remember something. Oh yeah, Josh Acraft, got it, got it. But, um, but yeah, we are our handles, that's definitely a thing. I forgot Pinder's name for a very yeah. long time. Yeah, it's Pinder. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. 
Um, so I think we're about, maybe about halfway through. I think there's like a few more things I want to say before we open it up to questions. And But the one question I really do want to get through is just kind of asking everybody what is maybe like one specific PAX experience as an enforcer that sticks out to you as something that was like, it could have been a small moment where you really enjoyed helping somebody or like one of the weirdest things you ever had to do or just some of the like, uh, what's, what's the one thing that I say like, what's, it, what's your enforcer thing? Uh, I think Kristen, what is this? Uh, you, you no, I, I was thinking, what can I legally disclose? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, hey, if you guys don't know about it, then I did my job right. <laughs> Basically, all I can say. Oh, all right. <laughs> Well, we have some slides lined up for, uh, so uh, there was this one thing that really stuck out to me um, a few years ago um, when uh, the unspeakable underbelly of gamer culture reared its ugly head. Uh, I, I feel like the enforcers really came together uh, in spite of that. Uh, and one of the things that happened was um, Susie, one of the most best people in the whole world, uh, made this Tumblr called um, feministpacksenforcers.tumblr.com. Uh, and she turned the Ryan uh, Gosling meme of like, hey girl, uh, into these feminist enforcers. Uh, and it's one of my favorite things that was ever made. And uh, she took uh, pictures of, of PAX enforcers and put like really adorable um, feminist uh, sayings on top of them. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's not any longer in use or being updated, but it's something that will always be a part of my heart that uh, at this time where this negative uh, undercurrent of, uh, of our culture was being so outspoken, that people really in my community took it upon themselves to say, no, you are welcome here, and here is why, and we are going to back you up, and we're not okay with this. Um, and there's been like a few times where that has happened where I'll get, like, we'll, we'll have like this text chain of like, I, I don't know, like, is this person harassing? I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna get them, like, blah, blah, blah. Or like, I, or like, let's talk to security, and blah, blah, blah. Like, I, that happens so much. We care so much about making this an incredibly accessible and open space. Uh, and it's so, so, so dear to me and makes me feel better on a day-to-day -day basis, like being in this industry at all. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we mentioned that because that was just such a, a, a positive thing. So one of my favorite enforcer stories, it's not something that happened while I was enforcing, but it will get there. Um, it was, again, the first time that I, I had a conversation with Trin, we were just kind of talking about like, oh yeah, you know, we, we, we met, you know, through, essentially through the internet of, yeah, Chicago enforcers are gonna be meeting up, having this tabletop game night, we're gonna get to know each other, some of us know each other, others didn't. And um, I had asked Trin kind of just like, hey, how did you end up, you know, coming to be an enforcer? What was your experience with it? Kind of like this panel, but in conversation, it made sense. And um, she, uh, she was telling me about, yeah, there was this, you know, I was on this flight to PAX one time, and um, I saw there were these enforcers that were sitting in front of me, and, um, you know, it was this guy and this girl, and, you know, they were kind of tipsy. They were using the Southwest Airlines drink coupons. They had all these drink coupons. They, like, gave them to me and my friend, and we, you know, like, drank with them, and they were just, like, these really friendly people. And she's telling me the story, and I'm like, yeah, that was my husband and my friend, Genia. I remember. They told me about, like, yeah, we got wasted on the flight, and we're giving out drink coupons. There were these really cool people behind us. And this was, like, years ago, and I was just like, I know exactly what you're talking about. So it was so cool to see that, like, like full circle, like enforcers, you know, being kind together, you know, and meeting up in the airport and just, you know, kind of sharing the love and having that come full circle. And I, like, with one of my best friends in the world, like, now I can see, like, that was kind of a genesis of this energy and bringing us together. So it's just really good people, um, you know, again, even extending beyond the con itself. When you meet someone who's an enforcer out in the wild, it's always just like a really magical kind of partnership. I, I do have a personal story that I share um, anytime someone asks me to try and define the enforcers and the community and what it means. Um, and I, I, have, uh, I have three kids, actual kids, not the thousand big ones. Uh, and uh, my older son has a, a large variety of neurological disabilities. Um, when uh, he was nonverbal until the age of four, and uh, he had um, a stuffed animal, a stuffed guinea pig, that um, was essentially his lifeline. It, he, he, uh, we did very intensive speech therapy um, at that point because we were, you know, trying to uh, encourage that. And um, there would be many times uh, whenever he was under any kind of pressure and often during speech therapy when he would not speak to other people but he would try to speak to his guinea pig. Uh, the guinea pig uh, was, he, he couldn't sleep without it. He, he needed it to function. Um, and this is my son Cassio when he's, uh, he's probably about four in those photos and that's guinea. 
Um, guinea was one of the only words he could say, and he needed that guinea pig. And uh, we went to Disneyland that year, and we lost guinea. Um, and it was the most traumatizing thing that could have possibly have happened to him, and it literally took away his ability to speak. Uh, and uh, we were desperate. Um, my husband and I did everything we could think of. We, uh, guinea pig had originally, guinea pig is actually a ghost sig Morven from Ikea. <laughs> um, and uh, we went back to the Ikea to try to find another one and uh, found out that guineas had been discontinued for like over a year. And, you know, I called Ikea corporate headquarters to try and find one and I gave everybody my sob story and um, no one could track them down. Uh, so someone said to me, um, well, you, you know, you're in charge of an army, why don't you just get them to go look for a guinea? And I thought, oh my god, you're right. <laughs> so I went on to the Enforcer Forum, and um, this is from 2010, and I made a very heartfelt plea to uh, the Enforcer community at that time, and I said, okay guys, this is my sob story. Um, Ikea said that there's always a possibility that there might be these guinea pigs in uh, like the liquidation or discard or like, you know, like the cheap area um, that aren't in the inventory system, but maybe there are some out there. And there are enforcers all over North America and they basically just, they had their marching orders and they went and they searched every single Ikea in North America to try and find this guinea pig. And they, no one could find them. Um, and we were just, okay, well, life moves on, Guinea is not recoverable, we will try to uh, get a, something else that's similar or try to find something else we could give him. And then I get a phone call about a month later from an enforcer uh, named Marsupial Mammal, and he says, so I've got a funny story. My wife and I, and I think they were in Florida, if I remember correctly, were walking through a mall, and they, his wife pointed at a claw machine and said, hey, weren't you looking for a stuffed guinea pig? And there's a stuffed, there is a Gosig Marvin in the claw machine in this mall in like Gainesville, Florida. And he's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> and he rolls up his sleeves and puts like $30 of coins into this claw machine. And he admitted that he was not very good at it. <laughs> and his wife is literally like going to get more quarters than coming back so that he can keep trying to get this guinea pig, and he does, and they end up, and she said to me, they had to get a bag, because they ended up with like 20 other stuffed animals <laughs> while they were trying to excavate the guinea pig, and they got the guinea pig out, and he mailed it to me, um, and we were able to replace guinea, and uh, we called it New Guinea, because of course <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my son would recognize that it wasn't the same guinea pig because it had a different pattern on it, but it was close enough that it actually did the trick. And it was the most important thing. It's one of the most important things that's ever happened to me in my life. And um, I can't express my gratitude to the enforcer community for just the the unquestioning. We we're on it, boss, and and they looked high and low and. Ultimately, for this very strange route, we're successful and we're able to replace this thing that was the most important thing, most important possession that my son had. Um, that's the story I always think of when I think of enforcers, and then I cry. Uh, so that's, that's one of the perfect examples to me of what the, it's like crystallizes the enforcer community in my mind. Yeah, if that's not above and beyond, I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> <laughs> Follow that more than. Yeah. <laughs> I, the only thing I'll say is, I tell this to my enforcers uh, before the show, is we as enforcers, we as show staff, really can punch above our weight. We can do one small thing for us that makes the entire show for an attendee. Um, and it can be something as simple as a man who got everything that was needed. It was a scavenger hunt to get a t-shirt. He'd never been to PAX before and he really loved this game. Um, and they were giving out t-shirts and he had everything. And the person who was running the booth, for whatever reason, just didn't believe him or it was too late in the day by two minutes or something like that. 
And so I see this guy in the hallway with his friends and he's having a really hard time and I ask what's wrong. And he says, I got all these codes, I just want the t-shirt. And he goes downstairs and I say, all right, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. And I walk up and I ask the booth, hey, can I get a men's large? He said, yeah, here you go. <laughs> and I walked down and handed it to the guy and he, his face lit up. He was like, thank you, this is amazing. You enforcers are great. Um, it took 30 seconds and it made his show an awesome show. Um, and enforcers, we all love to do things like that. We all like to help out, that's why we do this. Um, and if it's helping out our dear mother, PRD, or if it's helping out an attendee, or if it's helping out another enforcer, we're gonna do our dampest to make sure that that gets done. Yeah. Uh, there's actually, Trin, I want to ask you about this thing that happened just yesterday while we were oh. working at Tabletop Late Night. Um, uh -huh. This was a pretty fun experience of Trin uh, doing a very similar little fun thing. Oh, um, so I was working Tabletop and uh, this young child that I just saw the future of our nerdum <laughs> and <laughs> was like, do you have a D&D? &D? And I was like, uh, I don't, <laughs> but I will help you. And we just kind of like perused the entire section and I was like, okay, so this game is kind of like D&D &D in a box, but like it's really complicated and like, I like if you don't want to like learn a bunch of rules because you're tired and it's late at night, like maybe we should do this game. Uh, I ended up not really helping her. Somebody else found. Uh, <laughs> I think what was it? It was like a one box dungeon. It was like perfect, and I'm so mad I didn't think of that. Anyway, uh, I think it was probably a more positive experience for me than it was for her. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it just reminded me that there are kids here that see us and see us in authority and see us just wearing a shirt and and they see what they can be someday i know that sounds like a really big statement but it's not like we look like police officers to them you know like we look like a teacher to them uh and if we can be kind and nice and um say it's okay to begin here um it's okay to not know everything it's okay to be too tired to learn a whole book of rules right now no one's going to be mad at you um i think that that's incredibly important um and i see that happening like every day with enforcers like i see everybody not being an enforcer or, like muscles up but more like a guide or a shepherd uh, and I think that that is such a beautiful component of, of what we do here. Yeah. And when we open up to questions, I would really love to also open up to stories because I see a lot of familiar faces here that I know probably also have like fun stories like this. And I, and I think that this is a sharing time. Yeah. Um, so I think really the, the real last question that I want to directly ask before we open it up um, to the audience here is really just what advice um, would you have for somebody who is interested in becoming an enforcer, whether that is advice on how to apply, um, or once you become an enforcer for the first time, like here's what I wish I had known during my first shift. Um, just any piece of information along that that you think would be valuable um, to somebody who's starting out. I well, think. To get the housekeeping um, right off the bat done, when, when a uh, show um, opens up for ticket sales, uh, you can go to the, you know, where, where you'd go to the website, the PAC site, for whichever particular packs you're talking about. Um, one of the headings is enforcers, and you can go there, and that's where the enforcer application is. So if you're interested in becoming an enforcer, you apply through the website. It's a, it's a, a resume, basically, not a resume, an application, um, which, is, which is taken seriously, like as a job application should be. Uh, so my advice is to treat it seriously, to treat it like a job application, because that is essentially what you're doing. Um, enforcers are paid. It is a job application. Um, they're not volunteers, it is a paid job and they work for every penny uh, and they deserve, they deserve every penny and more. So um, just to, to fill out that application as though you were applying for a job because that's exactly what you're doing. Um, one of the, the prep questions that we have here on our sheets is pick three adjectives that describe a great enforcer. There's one, passion, be passionate. Whatever else you are, we've got a place for you. You can be bold and gregarious, like me. You can be shy. You can be like introverted. Okay. You can be extroverted. There are people of every single theoretical type. Anything you can think of. And, and ability. Um, yes. Ability is another, you know, I, I often receive emails from people who are like, well, you know, I always wanted to be an enforcer, but I'm in a wheelchair. That's not going to stop you. I got 
trust me, I got tons to do for someone who is sitting down. Like, it's not a problem. So, you know, whatever concerns you have that you think might be an impediment, they're not. You know, I, I need people of every, every possible gender, ability, uh, you know, sexuality, whatever you think it might be a label that is going to be against you, it's not. I need everyone of all types. The more there are, the better we The are. more the better, because then we can better serve our PACS community. Diversity is key with my enforcers. Absolutely. And just kind of breaking down some of the barriers I had in my head before I enforced was, you know, like everyone's been doing this forever, and you know, this is going to be my first PACS, or I don't play all the games, I just play the games I like to play, and you know, I just don't know all of the, all of the in-jokes and stuff like that. Just, you begin where you begin. You know, everybody has a first PACS, everybody has a first experience. Not everybody plays all the games, and if you do, you might not be the best at all of them, but like, don't ever let it feel like it's a competition that you're not going to be able to win because you're not enough. Just start where you start, find your people. You aren't going to know every single enforcer there, what, 4,000 of them, um, but you'll find your people, you'll find your niche, and it'll be great. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Carlin, especially the you don't have to play all the games. Uh, I remember I walked into uh, uh, the uh, enforcer area the very first time, my very first PAX, and I was talking to this guy, and I, I made like a like a little like Mass Effect reference, and he was like, oh, I, I haven't played Mass Effect. Um, it, like, it, it was as though I was going to strike him for it. <laughs> uh, and I was like, dude, it's okay. Like, and so we started doing this thing that um, Carlin actually introduced at our, our game nights in Chicago, which is List Your Nerd Sins. And I was like, I've never played a Zelda game. I've only watched people play it. Yeah, I know. I heard some gasps. So, like, so, it, so it was just kind of like, it's, it's okay. Like, we're all here for the same reason even if we have like different uh, areas of expertise and that's fine uh, and, and I think that's really cool um, and I the, my last comment on that is uh, you're not a super soldier <laughs> when you're an enforcer you're not Captain America <laughs> like uh, take a break have a snack put some inserts in your shoes uh, like we all are here to like, work hard but no one's here to work the hardest uh, and uh, we're all here to support each other and, and just do the best we can. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. So, I mean, that's really all that I have prepared. Um, so, at this point, if anybody has any questions, I think we would love to hear them. I guess we can go to that microphone if you want to get heard, otherwise you can yell. Uh, but let's do, yeah, let's do the microphone just so we can get a good line going. Uh, great panel, by the way, guys. Uh, yeah. Take us through kind of like uh, the a, a, a day at PAX and the eyes of enforcer. I, mean, I think we got a pretty good sense of the community. I'd like to know, like, just break down a typical day yeah. Uh, yeah. from like early in the morning till we show. You know, close we the show. we run on a three shift day during the PAX day, so um, our staff are scheduled morning shift, afternoon shift, night shift. So it's going to depend what time of day you're starting. But there's sort of a the order may change, but the, the tasks are sort of followed. Um, we do have an HR, a brief HR process that we have to do on our first day. Uh, you know, there's paperwork that needs to be filled out. You need to pick up your shirt, you need to pick up your badge. Um, we have a staff room that um, has uh, snacks and you can put your bag and stuff like that there. So sort of on, a, like a, like on your standard first day, an enforcer is going to come in. They're going to go through their, their HR badge pickup process probably go to the staff room, drop off their stuff, um, meet some people there, and then they're gonna report to where, uh, whatever department they're working in. And uh, those departments, I mean, there, there's, depending on the PACs, there's 35, uh, between 30 and 35 different departments. Um, and and their, you know, expo hall, which is huge, to uh, the CTF team, which is small. There's, there's different, you know, levels of, and uh, play, you'll go to wherever that department is, potentially meet some of your team, potentially meet all of your team, and um, then you'll just get your, your sort of your marching orders and your instructions. Uh, the shifts right, range between five and six and a half hours, so, that, you know, and with three of them over a day. You're going to do whatever task you're instructed to do for that time. Uh, and then at the end of that shift, shirt's off, and you're free to do whatever you want. The pass is good for, you know, it's a show pass. You can go anywhere and do anything as though you were a normal attendee. Um, and uh, have fun, hopefully. We, we try really hard to make sure, so I, like, I do all of the, I do the, the hiring, um, the training to some extent, depending on what it is, uh, the scheduling and the management of all the staff. It's, it's all me, it's all one person. So there's one person handling, you know, everybody's applications and stuff. So I'll, I'll read everything and I do it all manually. 
partly because I'm old fashioned and partly because I want to get to know everybody. So I want to read about what your interests are, you know, that's all going to be in your application and, and I'll be keeping that in mind when I'm trying to place people in the right departments. Um, and, and, you know, if there's tournaments that you want to go to or particular panels that you're interested in, I try to factor all of that in. So ideally, whenever you're working, it's not going to be like at peak prime time hour for the stuff you're interested in. Uh, so hopefully you'll get off your shift and then you'll be like, oh yeah, just in time for concerts, which is like why I'm here. And then you're going to go into a mosh pit and have a great time. <laughs> so that's hopefully how a day would look. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for that question. Let's go. Yeah, let's do oh, a quick two. switch off. I didn't even realize there was a second mic. I didn't Sorry. Either. Yeah. Hi, I'm Trent Tor, third year enforcer. Hello. Hello. Hi, Kirby. Um, Hi. So I have two things. One, I have a, a nerd sin. <laughs> Uh, I've never never played, um, not Bioshock, uh, you just said it. Mass Effect? Mass Effect. Mass Effect. I've only ever watched people play Mass Effect. Get so. out! fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I actually wanted to share a really quick story, just for everyone's here. Um, so I work, I've worked PC now for the third year, and every year in PC, um, I see families come in with small children. Sometimes they're playing you know, Minecraft or things like that, and there's almost always a parent with them. And I always like try to seat the parent, but you know, either out of policy or also because I want that parent to have fun too. And almost without fail, they're like, I'm just gonna surf the web, and I'm like, I'm like, you should try some games. Like, I don't know. What about that one? They're like, okay. And they start playing it, and then I come back by, and more often than not, I'm like, okay, guys, your time's up, and they're like, oh my god, oh, okay. <laughs> let's get back in line, and they jump out and that's get back awesome. in line. That's so that's really what I cool. share. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Andrew. Um, I Two part question. Yeah, good name. Uh, yeah, I know it's a great name, but I go by AJ, so. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 Get out. But I mean, the red shirt works, so it's good. Uh, so, what are the requirements to be an enforcer? And you mentioned training for the enforcers. I wonder what type of training you need. Sure. So, uh, I mean, the requirements, um, it's, I, I'm not, that's, that's kind of, that's a very, it varies. It definitely varies. It, it, yeah, that you have a pulse, that you are alive. Uh, that you are uh, 18 or older, uh, and that you are legally employable in the U.S. Um, because it is a job. So uh, you have to be able to receive a W-2 from PACs, because um, there's tax implications, obviously. Uh, so those are sort of the, the, the sticky requirements. Um, aside from that, you know, I'm looking for people when I'm reading the job applications who have filled up, taken the application seriously, uh, that um, are, in, you know, show some sort of ability to do a customer service kind of job because you, no matter kind of where you are, you are going to be talking to members of the public. Um, so I have to see that kind of represented in the application, and that you that you sound like you're interested and you want to do it. Um, and that sounds like it should be a no-brainer, but I actually do see a lot of applications that are like, you know, well, do you enjoy being in crowds? Do you enjoy interacting with members of the public? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, this probably isn't the job for you. You know, I hate to break it to you, but there'll be other people there. So, you know, I just want to see some sort of, sort of enthusiasm um, and interest in, uh, interest in being part of the enforcer community and helping the PACS community in the application. And, and then that's, you know, it's not like I'm, not like everybody has to know how to, a computer not everybody has to be a gamer. You know, that's actually one of the questions. Are you a gamer? And I actually had to put in brackets underneath, it's okay if you're not, you know? I have plenty of jobs where you're not gonna need to know who the love interests of Dragon Age are. Like, no one's testing you, you know? Oh, yeah. Registration is badge pickup, you know? It's not, you don't need to be a huge gamer to do that sort of thing. So, um, those are kind of the key points uh, in terms of what you need to be an, uh, an enforcer. Uh, and what was the second part of your question? Uh, what sort of training do you go, do you make? Again, that, that's going to vary by department. I'll, in general, a lot of it is just sort of done um, on-site. Like, yeah. line management is one of our larger departments, and there's not a lot of training required for that. You need to be uh, able, you need to be mobile, but it's going to be like stand here and tell people to go into this direction for this line or that direction for another line. It's not a high degree of training. But then our, our show floor staff, our expo hall staff, uh, and in particular our high level expo hall staff who are called XAs or exhibitor assistants, they're going to get a training guide like this and they actually go through, um, they do web, web webinar trainings, I hate that word, but that's what they do because they need to be very familiar with the booths that they're working with. They need to know um, what those products are or what those games are. I don't want to assign booth staff to and then have those people have no idea what they're 
they're talking about at those particular booths. So they have actually quite a bit of training um, and, and like a show open process and a show closed process. So it, it ranges from you don't, there's no training up to there's a high degree of training. Okay, thank you. And to some extent, the forums also um, help with that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's certainly not, it doesn't, you know, stand in for actual training there, but there are handy guides, I think, for every department of, so you're going to be this type of an enforcer. Here's kind of the lay of the land. Here's what we do if you have questions. It's a kind of way to off the clock figure we, out. We have, we have actually a, um, a project that's in development now called the Enforcer. There's a we have an Enforcer Development Officer um, who is working on standardizing all of those training guides and things like that. and going to be able to make it so that it's sort of like a one folder solution like you're an enforcer here's your here's your training manual um and also hopefully down the road be able to open it up to doing like a mentorship program so that senior enforcers can mentor uh younger enforcers not just for job training kind of things for packs but even other things like that might be applicable in in their um real lives like enforcers who work in areas where they do like for like for a random example maybe public speaking um, and as an enforcer, you can, you know, apply to, you know, it would really help me out if I was a more confident speaker. Can anybody help me with that? And have a mentor and pair them up and be able to provide, like, professional development that's applicable outside the enforcer community. I can't wait to have a son. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you, You're my enforcer son. Hi. Hello. Uh, well, I've, I've actually got a couple questions. Um, if at any point... Someone else comes up and you need to like tell me to sit down. That is entirely okay. <laughs> okay, you're good. Um, first of all, you said something about war stories earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I would be curious to know if there are any of those that you can share, and on the other hand, if there are any like overly heartwarming or funny or strange stories that you guys really want to share, or anything like that. I have a quick war story I can share. Um, it packs west in Seattle. Um, there was a year that I was a satellite theater manager, and it's a different setup from south. Like here, you know, it's everything is in one convention center, but in Seattle, it might be over different sites. Like part of it's in the convention center, some of it might be at an adjacent hotel. You know, it kind of takes over more of downtown Seattle. And we had a very big panel. Um, that a lot of people wanted to go to and to control the line for it, it had to snake through a hotel and at a certain point it started to go outside and people really wanted to line up basically throughout all of downtown Seattle and that wasn't something that we could allow them to do. Right. Um, and so that was very, very difficult because we had to basically just be bad cop again and again and again and say, I'm sorry, you actually can't do it past this point. We're giving it as efficiently as we can. Um, but at a certain point, one of the people on the panels was just kind of started tweeting and saying, you know, just show up, you know, even if they don't let you in, you know, show up. And so that was hard because that was the talent that was going to be on the panel and this is someone that, you know, I have to manage, but they're also directly going against me and saying, like, people just get here, you know, they can't turn you away. So that was very difficult for me in that situation. And of course we had to turn people away because there was only so much capacity for the theater. Um, so, you know, it wasn't just we were doing it to be mean. And so it was it was not a fun day for me. Um, and so just kind of, again, managing personalities and talent and being the bad guy to, you know, like a thousand people was super not fun. Um, I'm gonna uh, do a, a nice story to balance it out. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was, uh, a line entertainment uh, uh, enforcer, uh, and I was just kind of like helping um, shepherd somebody in crutches to like the front row of a satellite theater because I just happened to be there. Uh, and that's like that's our job, like that's what we do. Um, it was just it just so happened that she came late and like no big deal. Uh, but two years later, uh, she found me at uh, up this at Pack South last year and was like, hey. I remember you, because I, I had like a purple streak in my hair, so she found me again. Uh, and she was like, I just want you to know that I remembered what you did, and you were so kind to me, and uh, it made me feel so welcome. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I, and, and like I, I actually had to wrap my brain for a while thinking about like what she was talking about. And she was like, I was on crutches, and you, and you helped me, and you found me. And like to me, that was just like, that's literally what PRD tells us to do. Like, that's like job number one. Uh, and it was... It was probably top five moments of my life. It was really, really sweet. That's awesome. Um, so I think I'm going to say if we can get one question from you right there in the pool hockey jersey quick. Uh, and then I think we're really going to be out of time. But if anyone has any more questions, uh, I know I'm happy to stick around afterwards and answer them. But we will have to give up the theater. Thanks for your question. Okay, thanks for the, uh, let me have one last question. I mean, hockey afterwards. Uh, my name's Trey. Um, I'm going to have access uh, now. Um, and I have some friends who have been in Portsmouth in the past, uh, 2000, 
my town, roughly. And they described at that time that the organizational structure was kind of really flat, that there wasn't really a hierarchy. And from hearing y'all talk today, it sounds like that's changed a little bit. It's always that? pretty much been the same, but I, I think the reason why it does sort of look flat is because for the scale of the number of people, it, it, it is pretty flat. So, I mean, there, there's, um, for most departments, this doesn't apply to all of them, but for most of them, you have your department manager and the deputies, and then me. You know, or you, you know, your enforcers, managers, it's, so it's only like a three-stage pyramid. So there, it's not, it, which is pretty flat when you're talking about a show crew that runs, so here at South, which is our smallest crew, uh, we run with about 500 people, up to um, West last year was just over 1,000. So it, it's, you know, when you're talking about, you have 35 departments, 35 managers, me, but then there's 950 people underneath it. So yeah, that's pretty flat. Gotcha. Okay, awesome. Uh, if you yeah, have some time after, I'd love to talk to you. I've been involved with the QuakeCon organization for sure. years. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I, I've been to yeah, a few yeah, QuakeCons. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So uh, we are for sure already over our time, so I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut us right now. But if anyone has more questions, uh, feel free to just bug us right when we're done here. So thank, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you all for being on this panel. It was wonderful. That was a delight.